Hi, it's Kernatex here with a um, series of videos about building and installing Linux from scratch 10.0. Now this uh, set of videos is going to be um, more about the changes in Linux from scratch 10.0. Um, as I said in the introduction video, there's been um, quite a substantial change to the way Linux from scratch is built. They're using proper cross compilation method to separate the host from the target Linux from scratch system. So I won't be spending so much time explaining about um, LFS um, in particular. Uh, if you want more information, if you've never installed it before, then you're probably better off looking at one of my earlier videos, for example, the previous version 9.1 which um, goes into some depth about um, installing Linux from scratch and installing it side by side with Windows 10. So what I've done here, I'm going to use that version of Linux from scratch 9.1 with the BLFS packages that I installed as the host system for building Linux from scratch 10.0. So in effect, we're using LFS to build LFS, albeit an older version of LFS, um, to build the newer version of LFS. And there's not a problem with this, it's always been possible to do this because the way the um, LFS is built, it's perfectly feasible. Um, in fact, I've found in my tests that since they've gone to this new method of um, full cross compilation, I've, in my experience, I found it to be more reliable in terms of testing when um, the tests are run for various packages. I've had far fewer failures. Uh, there are one or two little exceptions to that, but I've found that there's probably to do with the host environment more than anything else um, affecting tests. But um, apart from that, yeah, it's I'm really excited about it because it, it's a, a huge step forward, I think, for Linux from scratch to to providing a, a better final environment and also a, a more enjoyable time building it as well um, knowing that after the test you can be quite sure that um, you're, you're building a, a good system. So as I say I'm using my previous version of Linux from scratch I built in my previous videos for Linux from scratch 9.1 with Beyond Linux from scratch so that's what's on the screen I'm going to log in and just show you one or two things to prepare how I'm going to prepare for this to install it on this machine. So effectively, um, if you've seen the previous videos or if you haven't seen the previ previous videos, I'll just, just explain. With the previous videos for Linux from scratch 9.1, I started out with a machine that just had Windows 10 on it. And I then showed how we can install Linux from scratch on that machine and finally add in Beyond Linux from scratch. So at the end of those previous videos, we had a machine that could dual boot Windows 10 and Linux from scratch 9.1. Because I'm reusing that machine now, what we're going to end up with today is effectively a triple booting machine. It'll be a machine we can still boot Windows 10 on. We can still boot Linux from scratch 9.1 and Beyond Linux from scratch 9.1 and also we can boot the new Linux from scratch 10.0 which is what I'm going to demonstrate now. So the problem we've got is there's no room on the disk to install the um, the new system. So if I run a program called gparted, this is a graphical front end to a program called parted which shows the layout of the disk. So if I just expand this. So you can see, uh, if you've never seen this before, basically at the top you've got a graphical representation of the disk and all the partitions in it. And then this section here lists all the partitions with all the various details on it. So you can see this partition here is quite a big one, takes up most, most of the physical disk. And that is the um, Windows partition. You can see it's um, approximately 160 gigabytes 
is about 64 gig free so therefore it's just about just under 100 gigabytes free and again if you watch the Linux from scratch 9.1 video you'll recall that I use Windows to reduce this partition to make room for the beyond Linux from scratch partitions which I, I use to build build those systems but of course I filled that up now um, if I click on the Linux from scratch partition beyond Linux from scratch 9.1 You'll see that's approximately um, 63 gigabytes. I've used about 53 gigs, so there's about 9.3 gigabytes free. Um, and as you can see, the only unallocated or spare space that's on the disk is only one megabyte in size. So somehow we need to make some room. Now, what I could do is reduce the Windows partition even further and just move these all along. Um, but that's going to take a lot longer. Um, I don't really, really want to do that at this point. So what I've decided I'm going to do is to reduce the size of the Linux from scratch 9.1 partition and make some room there. For a basic Linux from scratch system, well, it used to be you needed a, at least 8 gigabytes. I've found with this new version 10, you need a, just slightly more than 8 gigabytes of free space. So you need at least nine, preferably 10 for a bit of space um, to build it in. So as you can see, the free space on this partition is only nine, 9.3 gigabytes anyway. So I need to, without deleting the Windows, or, or sorry, not deleting, removing some of the space in the Windows partition, I need to find some stuff in the Beyond Linux from Scratch 9.1 partition that I can delete to make a bit more space a to leave some space for this partition in case I want to boot into it again and b to make myself enough space for the new Linux from scratch system now before I do that it's worth mentioning a couple of other things well three things actually the first thing is you'll notice that some of these partitions have got a little key next to them and that means they're locked because they're currently in use so we've got the EFI partition it's mounted at the moment and that's why it's in use and that's why we've got a key. We've got the boot partition which is mounted which is where the EFI partition is mounted. We've got the swap partitions in use and of course we've got the root system because that's what we've booted into. So we've got an issue here that how can I resize this partition if they're currently in use? Well I'll show you how I get around that in a moment. The other thing I need to point out is that we can we don't need to create new boot partitions or new EFI partitions or new swap partitions because we're only going to be booting one or other of the Linux from scratch systems, so either the older 9.1 or the newer 10.0 partition. These partitions, the swap and the boot partition, can be shared. So what we'll be doing is when we create the kernel for the Linux from scratch 10, I'll be writing it to the existing boot partition, so I'll be adding some more kernel files into that. And likewise with the swap, we'll just be mapping the swap for Linux uh, from scratch 10.0. We'll be using exactly the same partition, there'll be no problems with that. The only caveat with this is, is that if you've set up your Linux from scratch and you're using your swap as the hibernation partition, then obviously you can't do this because if you, for example, hibernate your Linux from scratch 9.1, you boot Linux from scratch 9.10, uh, sorry, 10.0, then it's going to wipe your hibern hibernation um, uh, image that's written to the swap drive, and um, you yeah, know that's going to cause all sorts of problems for your Linux from scratch 9.1. So if if you are using the hibernation, uh, the swap drive for hibernation, then you don't want to do this. You do want to create a separate swap. As I say, I, I'm not using hibernation, so I will be reusing the swap for both Linux and Scratch partitions. Okay, so first thing I need to do is to make some more space. As I say, we've only got 9 gig free. We need a minimum of 9 gig for Linux from Scratch 10. A third of a gig is probably enough to leave for Linux from Scratch 9.1 to boot into, but ideally I'd want to leave a little bit more than that. That's quite quite tight so what I should do first of all is I'm going to start a program called file light 
And if you're running GNOME, there is a qu an equivalent program um, which shows how files are allocated and where they're being used on the disk. Um, sorry, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but um, I'm sure you can find it. You could, of course, even install FileLite if you decided to. Um, and you, of course, need the dependent Plasma libraries to do that. So as you can see, what this does is it shows a sort of map of how the directories are allocated, what sort of space is taken up. And you can see that from the root, there's 52 gigabytes of data um, allocated on the disk. And then the first, sec uh, first circle, the first concentric ring, you can see is split up into basically three large segments. There's some smaller ones here, but we're not worried about the small ones. We'll just concentrate on the big ones. And you can see the first one, sources. Well, that's the source files for the um, Beyond Linux from Scratch and Linux from Scratch. So there's quite a few in there. Then we've got user. Well, we don't want to touch anything there because that's got all the libraries and um, programs and so on that's uh, in use by the system. So we don't want to touch anything there. And then we've got opt. So opt's got all the um, large optional packages. It t in BLFS, there tend to be ones where we can rip place them with newer versions and you'll notice within that there's one called text live which is the biggest by far it's taking 12.2 gigs so out of 17 gig 12 gig of it is with taken up with text live and if we further go further outwards of these concentric rings you'll see that there's two versions of text live there if you recall if you watched my blfs 9.1 videos um, there was a reason for not installing the 2019 version that was on in the book originally and it was advised that uh, the 2020 version was installed probably a security issue I can't remember the exact details but I kept the old version around just in case it was needed well it's I've put do not use against it we did install um, 2020 you could probably find it here somewhere I imagine um, where it is, I'm not sure, but we can certainly de delete that. It's it's not going to be in use at all. So what I can do is right click that there, delete that, and I'll just do that again to see how big it was. Yeah, it's going to release five gigabytes, so it's more than enough for what we need. I'll delete that, and you see it says it recursively deletes anything. Okay, so it's not deleting it, and that's probably because I'm um, a normal user and it's not allowing me to delete that. So what I'm going to have to do is to get a console up, become the root, and I'll go into the ops directory, and you can see uh, the text live directory there. So I'll go into that, and there's two versions, and I can do du minus sh star and it will show me the sizes of those two folders. You can see the newer version is slightly bigger than the older version. So I'm going to do RM minus RF 2019 and tab. And as soon as I do this, it will just disappear. It won't go into the waste bin or anything. That'll be the last chance. And now if I do a disk free to show how much space I've got, you see the root's got 15 gigabytes free. So that should be plenty of space now. Um, if you are searching around for a bit more space, I'm just wondering if I've got the, yes, I've even got the sources still there as well, Text Live 2019 sources, so I could remove them as well. So I'll do an LS-L, Text Live 2019 star, and you'll see that one of these is just under three gigabytes in size. They go 2.7 gig. So what I shall do is remove them as well. Just for a bit of extra space. Disk free shows 18 gigabytes free now. So that's more than enough. And I can rescan this now and it should show that the total usage has gone down from 57, approximately 57 I think it was to 
um, 44 gigabytes and you see the layout of this has changed quite a lot now it looks quite a lot different user is now the biggest um, first level directory followed by sources and now opt is the third biggest rather than the biggest directory and of course the biggest user of that is the text live installation so that's made the space so now we've got the problem of how do we um, get this space into a separate partition so if I refresh this refresh devices it will reread the disk and you can see there's a lot more white space there now this yellow went about as far as here I think before and you can see if I click on that that there's just under 18 gigabytes free well what we can do is we can use a live um, distribution called gparted live so if I type that in and if we go to the page and it, I'm not going to go into too much details about this or how to install it um, the instructions on the web page are very detailed but basically what you can do is you can download the image download the correct image for your system so I'd expect to be following this with a Windows 10 um, installation 64-bit computer you'd be using this image if you're on a 32-bit PC then you'd want this image and the installation instructions are so very useful you probably want to install it on a USB you could do it from Windows I'd recommend doing it from Linux and it's very simple if you go down the bottom here these instructions here it's just this one command you need to do to write the USB heed this warning though make sure you've got the right device when you've plugged in your USB um, flash device before you run this command but um, this is by far the simplest I've found you don't need any other third-party programs or anything um, as I say just this one command will do the job for you um, as I, say, I won't go into inst uh, showing how to install that um, the details are very detailed here it shows you everything that you need to do so I have already got my boot USB so what I'm going to do is to close these things down um, let's get rid of that window and I'm going to reboot the machine now when you reboot you might need to um, press a button to do F12 uh, sorry press a button for example for me it's F12 or it might be F10 or F2 to change the order of the boot menu or you might be lucky and you might find that USB flash drive is automatically detected as the first boot partition so mine won't do that I will have to press F12 to get a boot menu up to allow me to select it as the boot device so I'm going to plug it in before the machine reboots I'm just going to wait for it to reboot now and I'm just going to hold my F12 in like I say it might be an F2 might be F9 could be F10 F12 might be another button even so the boot device I want to boot from is this one here and what we get is this lovely menu coming up with the live the gparted live system now generally um, it should boot successfully from the first option if you have problems with the video getting corrupt or you're getting blank screens the um, option you want to choose for is this third one here press enter and then select this third option here save graphics settings that should um, allow you to boot but um, I think on this machine it does boot successfully so I'll press enter there this is an old USB drive so it's going to be a little bit slow unfortunately but it will get there eventually so I'll just wait for this to boot now 
as it boots, it will um, come up with some menus asking us um, about the type of keyboard we've got, what language we want, and so on. So when that appears, I'll uh, carry on. And when this does boot, if you have any um, BIOS error messages, they will appear here as they have done here now. Generally not um, a problem to worry about. Some BIOSes have got ACPI bugs in them. Um, you tend to see those appear quite often um, if BIOSes have got that error. But generally, I, I won't worry about any error messages that appear at this point. It is still booting, even though it looks like it's uh, got stuck. It is still booting. It's just, um, as I say, really slow, this USB device. And what this is doing is it's um, basically the GPARTED program we saw uh, before in KDE. It's the same program. It's just in, on its own bootable medium. So I think it fits in about 500 megabytes as I remember this is a one gigabyte flash card but I think it, it's it's approximately 500 megabytes so you can use that's why I've used an old one because it's so tiny you can use just any old um, USB flash card you've got lying around And here's the first menu, it's asking us what um, if we want to modify the uh, key map. So I do want to modify it because I want to make sure I'm using a UK keyboard. So just press the up arrow to select the key map from the arch list. It's a QWERTY type keyboard, so I'll accept that default. And then I'll just select the language I want. And the type of keyboard is a standard keyboard. And now it wants to know what language I want. So I'm going to select O2 for British English. And then again, this is somewhere where the video could fail. So generally just press enter to start it automatically. Or you could set, select one of the other prompts. You probably don't want option two because you won't get the graphical front end. You could try uh, option one. But generally I would, I would try rebooting and just use the standard VGA if you are having problems. But I'm going to select the default here. And should come up with the graphical front end very soon. Okay, so this is desktop loading. It should run GParted automatically. There it is. And that's it. It's loaded. So as you can see, it's um, a similar window, window to what we had before. Same layout with the gra graphical representations of the partitions at the top and all the details listed below. But you'll note this time, of course, because we haven't boot booted from the first disk, SDA, that we haven't got any of these key symbols in this column now, um, meaning that none of the partitions are locked. We can modify any one of these partitions as we see fit. So as I said, what I'm going to do is modify the Beyond Linux from Scratch 901 installation. I could do the Windows one. Normally I would do because there's a lot more space on there. But it would it would take longer to do because I'd, I'd have to reduce this partition and then, then these partitions would have to all be shifted along and it would take a lot longer. Although this is an, an SSD drive, it would still be a lot more work and also a lot more risky if there's a power cut or some glitch happens. Um, 
there is a chance that the, all the data on this disk could be lost. So that's something worth bearing in mind if you've got documents or anything you wish to um, ensure don't get lost, that you may want to take a backup before you do any of these modifications. So this is the partition I want to uh, take some space from. And what I can do here is right click it and do resize and move. And I can just either drag this, and move it as I wish, or as you can see, you can use these plus and minus buttons, or I can set discrete figures here. So for example, I could say I want approximately 10 gigabytes. I could put that number in there, press tab, and that would have reduced it by roughly 10 gigabytes. And that space is where I can create my new partition. So if I do that, resize and move, you can see here it says it's 10 gigabytes free. So I'll create a new partition there. Prime partition, because this will be a GPT layout, so it will be a prime partition. Um, X4 file system is fine. I want to use all the all the space available, so it leaves no space at the beginning and no space at the end. Leave all settings as they are and click Add. And that's it. So I've now created, I've reduced this existing SDA9, which is where the LFS and BLFS 9.1 are. And I've created another partition. Currently, it hasn't been given a number yet. It will will be given SDA10 when it's been formatted. And all I need to do is to click Apply. Gives me a warning about potential loss of data. I'll just click Apply there, and it will start doing the changes. And you can click on Details here and get quite a lot of details. Just click on these little arrows. You can see what it's done so far and what it's about to do. So you can see there's a load of information there about what it's doing. So you can see at the moment it's relocating blocks in SDA9, which is our current LFS, BLFS 9.1 partition. So basically any, any allocated blocks that were on this part of the disk, it's now shifting them so that it can reduce the partition down. So it looks like it's just checking that now. Yeah, it's doing the actual shrink now. So it's moved the blocks and it's actually shrinking the partition now. So that's that partition shrunk. And now it's creating, in fact, it's finished. It's created the last, if I can just click on that arrow without that bar coming up, you can see it's created the partition. It's cleared in the old signatures, set the new partition type, and it's created the new file system of ext4. So as soon as I close this, it will refresh the details and we'll see that it's been called SDA 10 rather than new partition number one. And there it is there. So that's the only thing we need to remember now is that our root partition for Beyond Linux from scratch will be on um, SDA 10. So it's fairly easy to remember actually. 
and some scratch 10 on STA 10. So all we need to do now is to shut this window down, double click the exit button, and we can either reboot here or shut down and remove the disk. I'm just going to select reboot. Remove the disk in case it interferes with your boot up sequence, the USB flash disk. And here's the grub menu so we can now boot into Linux from scratch 9.1 again. And I'll log in. And we should be ready to go. Now, um, there's a couple of things. First of all, if you are following or have followed my BLFS instructions to the letter, um, and you've installed two particular packages called bind and unbound. I've found that they both interfere with um, similar tests in the Chroot environment uh, for TCL. And I think that's because neither of them, although I installed the packages, neither of them were configured. So the configuration for whatever configuration is there is invalid and it causes the uh, one of the tests, well, it causes some of the tests to fail, the HTTP tests, and in particular, they both cause one of the HTTP tests to hang, HTTP 11. So um, what I'm going to do before I go any further is to get a console up. I'm going to move that over here. Uh, I'll become the root. I'm going to stop those two services now, those two daemons, just to make sure that when I come to run the test for TCL that I'm not kiboshed by them. So I'm going to stop bind first of all, and the other one was unbound. And you can see the, that they're both to do with name resolution. So it's possible that the default configuration uh, causes some sort of lock in the TCL tests. Um, they may, may be trying to contact a server that doesn't exist or it can't get access, access to some particular name server or something. I'm not sure what it is. So that's something to bear in mind if you've installed those packages like I did but not configured them. Or indeed, if they're not configured correctly, if you have a, have configured them and they're not configured correctly. The next thing I need to do is to start with the actual installation. So I'm going to get the browser up. Let's just fit that in there nicely. And uh, let's get rid of that. So this is Beyond Linux from scratch. Right, what I will do, just in case, this um, Oregon FTP site, Oregon State University FTP site is really useful in case some of the packages don't, don't, don't download. I don't expect to have this problem, but it's always worth having handy just in case. So I'm going to go to LFS. Um, assuming it's been updated, it might not have been yet. Yes, it is there now. So they're the packages we need in case we need to access that. Um, I'm not sure if the website's been updated yet. I've actually downloaded the. Let's do read online. I've downloaded the book. No, it still hasn't been updated. Okay, so what I'll do is. Um, I'll get it off 
my own server. Uh, I, the reason why I took a copy of it myself is because last time I was doing this, I was having problems with the you know, some scratch website. It seems to be stalling sometimes, so um, I'm going to contact my server. So all I've done is I've downloaded the LFS book from the LFS website. Um, so I'm just reading a local copy, but this shouldn't be any different from the online version when, when it does get published on there. So again, as I said before, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining about LFS itself. It's going to be more about the changes and just going through the differences that um, have been done here. So there'll probably be less explanation about Linux from scratch from myself, but it's all there in the book. As before, if you're new to LFS or you're still quite a novice with LFS, it's always worth reading these first chapters to get an understanding of how things are done and why things are done in certain ways. So I'm just going to skip past these until we get down to the um, nitty gritty, basically. Yeah, that, this is quite an uh, important chapter. It goes through explaining what different chapters are and how they do and what, what each chapter um, hopes to achieve. Then we've got a page showing what's different. So there's always quite a few packages in there. The toolchain packages always tend to be updated, which is kind of understandable. They're the core of the system. And change log there if you want to know about all the changes and resources, places to go for help facts and so on and some more information there about reporting errors if you want to report errors it's not just enough to send the last line the previous lines give a lot more information so preparing a host system so we've done some preparation already so if I do F disk minus L oops if I split right you can see there's our new partition we've created um, and this is the one that we're currently running on so if I was to do mount grep sda9 you'll see it says that it's mounted on the root so that's our currently mounted partition and this is the partition for the new let's go scratch 10 So host system requirements, well in theory, because we've come from just while well, we're running the previous version of Linux from scratch, there shouldn't be any problems with these versions, but there's no harm in checking. So all we do is just copy the script in and the command to run it. And we can go through and double check that the versions tally up. So bash version 5 we need 3.2 and it says bin sh should be a symbolic or hard link to bash which it is bin utils we've got 2.34 we need 2.25 that's okay need 2.7 of bison we've got 3.52 bzip2 we need 104 oh sorry we, there's a, a link for user bin yak which we've got there Bzip2 is 104, we've got 108. Core Utils needs 6.9, we've got 8. Diff Utils 2.81, we've got 3.7. Find Utils 4.2.31, we've got 4.7. Orc 401, we've got 501, plus a user bin Orc link, which we've got. Uh, GCC should be 6.2. We've got 9.2 and you can see also we've got a um, C++ compiler there, 9.2 as well. GDBC 2.11, we've got 2.31. Grep 2.5.1a, we've got 3.4. GZ 1.3.12, we've got 1.10, so it's fine. 
Linux kernel 3.2, we've got 5.5, which is pretty new. Um, M4, we need 1.4.10, we've got 1.4.18. Make 4.0, we've got 4.3. Patch 2.5.4, we've got 2.7.6. Perl 5.8.8, we've got 5.30.1. Python 3.4, we've got 3.8.1. Sed 4.1.5, we've got 4.8. Tar 1.22, we've got 1.32. Textinfo 4.7, we've got 6.7. And Xed 5.0.0, we've got 5.2.4. And last of all, you can see that the C compiler has been tested and it's run OK. So. As expected, it's all good, but it's probably worth double checking. So, some information here about creating a partition. This is a bit we've already done. Creating a file system. Well, there should already be a file system on there, so we can do a file check. We can do a full file check on def sta10, and it's passed as, as you'd expect. In, in fact, the GPath head uses the default. Um, E2FS programs to create the partitions and so on. So there should be no problems there. And as I said, we've already got a swap uh, partition, which is, let's just take a look at that. So you can see it's uh, dev SDA8. In fact, also if we look at the FS tab, it should be in there as well. Uh, there it is there. So that's all okay. So the first most important thing we've got to do is to export this LFS variable, which is used quite a lot. So let me copy all of that. And if you're ever unsure that that variable is whether it's set or not, just run the echo dollar LFS command to, to view it, to see if it is set. If you don't have it set, it can cause problems and the build will fail. Um, so best to double check if you're at all unsure whether it is set or not. So the first thing we're going to do is to make a mount point where we can mount the uh, partition where we're going to put the new LFS. I can run this command in here to mount it. Just change this triple X for SDA 10 and it's been mounted. So you can see it's there in the list of mounted file systems and we've got 9.3 gigabytes free. So that's plenty. Using multiple partitions, so if you're using separate user or home directories, you need to do more mounts. And if we're using a swap partition, make sure it's enabled to swap on where it should be on already, which it is. So it's only a gigabyte in size. Um, we shouldn't need it. There's a gigabytes on this machine, but um, if you are limited on your memory, you may well need to have um, a bigger partition. Um, I would say probably gigabytes big enough for any system actually, even if you're on really restricted memory, you probably wouldn't need much more than that. Certainly not for LFS. Uh, 